Hey guys, welcome to another Studio Sundays. I am your host, Gianna Andrews, and we are hanging out in my art studio. This last week, I was working on a desert-inspired piece that I'm really excited to show you. It's almost ready. But when I wasn't painting this week, I was talking to really interesting people. One of them was named Sarah Robbins. Sarah is our Studio Sunday Spotlight of the week. Sarah is an illustrator and muralist and has an impressive portfolio of work all around the Seattle area and across the nation. Her business is doing so well that she now even employs her husband. She finds the inspiration for her murals and her work through working with clients that have a cause. She wants to make the world a better place and she's just a really great human. I really enjoyed connecting with her. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. And with that, let's dive into it. Um, Sarah, welcome to Studio Sundays. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited. Okay, so where are you based right now? So I'm in Seattle, West Seattle. Um, but I've only been here since 2015. So almost a decade. Um, came from the East Coast. So I've kind of been all over the place a little bit. Okay. So what brought you out to Seattle? That's a complicated question. <laughs> That's um, okay. So grew up in upstate New York um, and then went to art school down in Washington, D.C. And then including school years, I spent like probably eight or nine years there. And then, I mean, I love the city, don't get me wrong, but like as far as art goes, it got really stuffy really quickly. Like everyone's wearing suits and it's just like, it's not, what do you do? It's who you know. And I just got like bombarded with DC politics. Um, so because of that, I was kind of looking for any excuse to leave. And the top cities I had on my list to move to were Seattle, obviously. Um, there's a small town in Virginia that I never thought I'd want to live in Virginia because of the heat, but it's just really cute. It's like a little college town and I could see myself there. Um, or Philly was another one. And then there was a um, artist position that opened up in Bellevue um, outside of Seattle. And I was like, oh my God, let's try for this. And I got it. They moved me across the country. I had never even visited Seattle or the Pacific Northwest. So it was kind of a big leap of faith, but it was the best decision ever. Totally. And was the job that you got, so you said there's an art position in Bellevue, was, who was that working for? It was actually, I was, um, they hired me to be the lead artist for Whole Foods. So oh. it was like way back pre-Amazon, pre-anything. And so we built, um, the Bellevue location was, it's their flagship store for Pacific Northwest. So like I was able to do really cool things like, oh my God, my first week, um, we like drove a Jeep into the um, store and made like this big outdoor camping display. Um, Elysian Brewing brought in one of their like big metal fermenters and I got to like letter and draw all over that. We got to build, build thing. Like it was just a really cool job. Um, it gave me a lot of confidence in thinking outside the box and kind of like getting creative with and getting kind of weird with things. Um, and I had a team of artists under me too, which was cool. Um, but long story short, then Amazon bought Whole Foods. Yeah. And then they completely cleaned house like company wide. Um, so all artists lost their job, which at the time sucked because I was here. I think it was only like four months in I had been here. So I was still like very new and very green. Um, but it was never my it sounds horrible to say, but like, I kind of used that job as a way to move across the, the country. It was never mm -hmm. like my end goal. Um, so it was really nice. That's when I took the jump into full-time for myself. Okay. New city. I have no clients. I have no, I don't know anyone. Like that was the tough part is like, if that had happened to me in DC, I would have at least had like a little pool of community to pull from where here I was like oh my god I don't have did, anything did you move completely alone out here too no no okay uh my now he's my husband but at the time mm -hmm. my boyfriend got with me like he had to find work out here too we moved for right. my job so then it was just like oh my god we have no income right now yeah I mean it worked out 
but um, it was scary. So you went to college in DC for fine art or was it art and illustration? I went to the Corcoran College of Art and Design, which is a teeny tiny school uh, right next to the White House. And um, it's actually the basement of a gallery. So like my graduating class was 55 people or something like it was very small. It was a little conceptual art school. Um, my degrees in fine art, they didn't have, like they weren't even big enough to have an illustration program, but you could do, I learned how to weld. We did furniture building. We did mold making. We did um, oh my, ceramics, every, like photography, everything. So it was really cool at, at that size. You can kind of dip into everything and just get like a well-rounded I don't know, base of knowledge. Okay. So, cause it's kind of seems like that's your skill set too, is like, um, just from the research I did about you and also your work, it's like, you're very well-rounded. You can do illustration. You can do murals. You got this job at Whole Foods and you were able to not only create installations and like work with other artists, but also actually do the lettering and create the art. And it sounds like your college helped that as well. So I want to go back to like the early days a little bit. Um, you said you grew up in upstate New York. Were you a creative child? Were your parents creative? What was your childhood like in harboring creativity? Or maybe it didn't harbor any. There is a little bit of creativity in my family. Um, my aunt is the art director for the Holocaust Museum. Um, so she's probably the artiest, designiest family member I have. Like my mom was a special ed teacher her whole life. Um, actually, now that she's retired, she's getting into glass. So I do think she has that creative gene in her. But it, it was like, it wasn't until she was like in her 60s that that actually came out. Um, but for me, yeah, I've been making stuff since I was a kid. I remember, like I had this pond, I was a little bit of a tomboy. I had this pond in my backyard. And I would go out there and I'd like dig up the bottom of the pond because there'd be clay. And it's just this like natural clay that was in my backyard. And I'd like make things out of it. I used to like to make books. I would make, like, I still have this, there's a book somewhere that I have from, I was like six and I made one that was all about bugs, mm -hmm. um, really in the outdoors, if you can't tell. But yeah, I kind of just always made things and I went through like phases. Sometimes it'd be drawing, sometimes it would be like building things, but it was just kind of always ingrained in me. And I thought it was kind of weird that my friends didn't have that skill or that, that interest as much. Were you an only child? No, I have an older brother. Not okay. He's not artistic at all. Okay. Actually, that's not true. He's a chef. Okay, um, that's a different type of artistic. Yeah, creative adjacent. Um, yeah. yeah, he's really good. But as far as like art, art. Yeah. Were your parents supportive when you decided to go to art school for college? My mom was. My dad, my, my dad's a tough subject. He, he was a photographer, but he like did medical photography. And he did a little bit of like fine art photography just as a hobby, but he did not, he was very much like, you shouldn't do this. Or if you do want to go to art school, go to a state school, because then you can get like a liberal arts degree and have something to fall back on. And I wasn't having that. I wanted like a traditional art school education. And luckily my mom supported me totally. I like the rest of my family did. It worked out for the best. I wouldn't trade that education. I mean, I graduated with $100,000 in student debt. Like it was a huge ordeal. Yeah. And I still wouldn't trade it for the world because it was like the best time of my life. It made me into like a real human. And so my dad was wrong. Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes <laughs> totally. I think our parents just want to like protect us and especially that generation of like, there just were less possibilities and things were much more by the book during that time. Yes. So I think it maybe more comes out of like, to like a fear or like wanting you to like, have a good life and like protect you. Um, I mean, I experienced a similar thing with my parents too, where it's like, there was this phase when I was like, I'm going to be an artist where my dad's like, what are you doing? Like, get a job. Yeah. but now he's on board, you know, they come around. Yeah. And I get it. Like if, if I had a kid, I'd be like, very hesitant with that, because it's hard to prove or at the at that point, it was hard to prove to my dad, especially like like the people who are successful with art degrees are the ones that work really hard for it. And it was hard to prove to him how strongly I felt and like how I would kind of do anything to become a success. Like failure was not an option because of a the money that went into it. Um, and I had moved cities and like it was just a big ordeal where I didn't want that to mean nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that kind of 
as much as obviously I wanted him to support me, it was kind of this little push of like, oh, I need to prove him wrong. And it made me into like a more of a hard worker and kind of like a go-getter. So did you ever consider like you're in DC, I'm sure the fine art scene there is pretty like you were saying people are wearing suits, like it's kind of a more of a bureaucracy and you kind of found your way to murals. Do you think, do you attribute like the murals and illustration avenue that you're pursuing now to getting that job at Whole Foods and then ending up out in the Pacific Northwest and and kind of like developing that or before you moved, um, did you know that that's what you wanted to do? Kind of a little bit of both. I always liked the like permanence of murals. Like and even in um, high school, like I didn't ever like painting on canvases because it felt, I don't know, it just didn't feel like me. Like I would paint on, I'd go to Home Depot and get like the like unfinished slab wooden doors. And so it, that those were like seven feet wide, I guess at that point, because you're painting them in a landscape form. Um, but like huge kind of like more substantial things to paint on. So like panels and then walls. My high school bedroom was a rotating canvas. I had maybe four or five murals painted on there. I don't know how my mom's going to sell that house because it's just, <laughs> I think I left her with ones that are like paint splatters. So she'd have to like sand down the walls. It's going to be a whole thing. That's um, hilarious. But yeah, um, I did experiment on walls. I didn't do any murals. Oh, that's not true. I did a couple murals in DC, but nothing major. Um, it was just kind of a way to get my feet wet and then got more into it out in Seattle. I think I just like the scale and I like the process of them and they feel a little more like substantial, like something that's more permanent than just artwork. So I kind of fell into it naturally. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the best way. It's like, you're just more drawn to, to that Avenue. And so did, so had you really painted, did you paint a mural when you were working for Whole Foods or did that come about after? Um, let's kind of dive into like, what was that transition? So Amazon bought Whole Foods, you lost your job, a bunch of artists lost their job and you found, you became self-employed at that time and basically yep. began pursuing art. What was that transition like and how did you navigate that as far as also just getting clients and all of that? I'm extremely lucky with that part of my career because, well, let me go back to answer your question. I did one mural for Whole Foods and it was... Um, fairly small. It was back in DC. Um, it was just, they needed a wall filled and I suggested it and they said, yes. Um, but I didn't really have, that was almost more illustration, um, practice daily practice than kind of the large scale stuff. So then when we lost our jobs, I kind of, because I was kind of so scared, I'm like, Oh my God, what do I do? I treated it like I still had a job and I got up and I did, I worked on personal projects. Um, I wrote, I think there was like 10 total of, I wrote handmade cards to a couple organizations and small businesses around the city that I thought may be a good fit. And it wasn't, they were like coffee shops. There was like a barbecue place, a cupcake shop that actually is still one of my main clients today. So I wrote 10 cards and I think I got four responses and four jobs out of them, which wow. is a crazy return. I didn't That's expect crazy. That. And then Seattle's very small town feeling. So word of mouth spread. Um, I did little things. I kept social media going just to kind of like, that's where people found me, um, keep active on there. And then I kind of just kept going and kept going and kept going. And, you know, you have to take on jobs at that point that you wouldn't take on today just to pay the bills. But I got by for a couple of years and then I started to gain some traction. And um, I'm lucky to say that I, throughout that whole time, I never didn't have a job. I'd never didn't have a project to work on. So I think I'm the exception to a lot of the other experiences that I've heard, similar experiences from artists. But if you treat it like it's your job, even if it's not at that time. Um, that mindset, I think, really goes a long way and just kind of like keeping the pattern going and keeping the, the routine going. Yeah, I think that's really valuable advice. And I remember, especially when I was like 
floundering, like just having graduated college and going into um, trying to figure out how to become an artist. Uh, somebody said to me, you just need to start treating this like your job because you can sit around all day being like, nobody's emailing me. I'm not getting any clients, all of the, yes. these things. And like, if you're not actively putting in the work, like you're not really set up for when those clients do come. Like, how can you make yourself as prepared as possible for like your success yes. in the future? I was also struggling with, with the transition between kind of more corporate in-house work to my own stuff. Like what is my style even? So even if it was working on personal projects, it was practicing style, practicing um, application technique, like all of the things that kind of, like you said, it's setting me up to be professional and look, have like a nice end result, even though it may be like my first or second job out of a corporate environment. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? How long have you been full-time art? 2015. So okay. eight, eight years, nine years. Yeah. Going on a decade. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. That's um, so awesome. Yeah. It's fun. It's a dream job. Totally. And so you, you, you do a mix of illustrations and murals. Are your illustrations um, typically done in Procreate or how are you doing the work that's not getting blown up onto a wall? What's your process like with that? Um, yeah, I love Procreate. Um, I've been using that forever since it came out. Um, I know there's other programs out there that are competing, but I'm just so like, I'm a creature of habit and I'm so comfortable with Procreate that that's my go-to. Um, if something does need to be blown up bigger, then Procreate can handle. Um, Adobe just came out with that newish one, I guess in the, the past couple of years, Fresco. Yeah. Um, and that one I use to vectorize stuff. And I know you can do pixel art in that too, but I haven't really played around with that just because I'm a lover of Procreate. But um, those are the two main ones. Occasionally, I have the one called Astropad because um, I can never, I don't understand when people can draw on a tablet while looking at a screen. Um, oh, yeah. Not, I can't do it. So I got Astropad because I can draw, like it just mirrors my computer screen and I can actually draw in Photoshop or Illustrator, um, but on a surface. So those are my main three. Um, it depends on, you know, every project is different. It depends on what kind of deliverables they need, but I really don't stray from those for um, drawing. Yeah. And you've done some really big walls, which are so impressive and beautiful, by the way. Um Thank you. <laughs> how, how do you go about, I think everybody kind of has a different technique. There's different techniques. How do you go about getting the idea up onto the wall for painting? Are you freehanding it, gridding? What's your process like with big wall painting? Um, my preference is to always project it just because it saves so much time. 100%. Um, so that's primarily what, what we're going for up front. If that's not possible, whether it's like too big or I did one this summer that, um, it was like columns under a uh, freeway. So I'm not gonna like project on a rounded surface cause it would get warped. Um, so I kind of get creative when projecting is not an option for those columns to, for example, I did grid it um, into four chunks. And then the beauty of my style is usually it's so organic that I can freehand and kind of tweak instead of having everything t needing to be very specific and very technical. Um, save some time. It's nice. Yeah. And I purposely design because I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to project this. Um, let's give like, let's build in some flexibility here. Um, so that's been been really nice with the freehanding. Um, if something does have to be specific, I usually do a grid. Um, I like the doodle method. I'm sure everyone talks mm -hmm. about that one. Um, but there's so many times that I'm not painting the background where that gets in the way because- Yeah, you have to, it has to be like a full-fledged painted surface exactly. for that to work. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of use all the tricks. It just mm -hmm. depends on what kind of wall I'm painting. Um, the weirdest one, there's one up in Ballard here that's like, it's two sides of an apartment building um, way like that was like a hundred feet in the air 
but it's on corrugated metal. Oh my God. That sounds insane. Just even projecting that alone was a whole ordeal. And then you can do that. How do you even project a hundred feet in the air? Well, I'm lucky enough to have a friend who, um, her husband is the guy that like, if you go to a concert, he's the guy that does the show behind the band. So like, Mm -hmm. he's really good at like high quality, huge projections. He has all the equipment to make it like bright enough to see. Um, so I hired him for a night and we sit out there in the cold and did it. Um, if he wasn't, if I didn't know him, honestly, I don't know how I would have gotten that up on the wall. I yeah. think it would have been a lot of trial and error. Um, but that one was tough because it's like you have to, since it's corrugated, you have to project only on the surface and then freehand all the parts inside. Um, I don't know, you just got to get creative. Yeah, I love it. Well, it seems like you, you're good at like improvising in those moments when you need to, which is really important, especially when being an artist. Cause I feel like no matter what, when you're working on these big projects, there's always going to be some variable that pops up that you weren't expecting. And so it's just figuring out how to deal with that on the fly. I'm a planner because I know, like you said, something's going to happen that I'm not accounting for. So having all the other stuff well thought out and being prepared, it helps tremendously in the long run. Yeah. And then what percentage of your work are you doing? Like you do a lot of client work, you do a lot of public art. How much percentage is like kind of for you or your own brand? Cause I see you sell like prints on, on your website and those types of things. Yeah. Not as much as I'd like, if I'm being perfectly honest, um, there are like, I have a slew of projects in my head and things that I'd like to do for myself. Um, people ask me for more prints all the time and I, I genuinely want to do them. Um, and I have them stored in my head. I just, the client work is insane. Um, and I do, yes, I, I shouldn't complain. It's great to be busy, but also I hear you where it's like, you have to maintain that level of, um, staying in touch with your own creative self. Totally. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've never been one of those artists who like, if someone's like, Hey, come do whatever you want. Like that makes me nervous. I don't want to actually do that because I like having some kind of boundary or parameters, um, to start from. Cause then it's like solving a puzzle instead of like, Oh, whatever. We don't care. Just come do whatever. Yeah. I, I like, I think that's why I also do client work more is cause I automatically start with those kind of parameters and I don't have to, like, if I'm doing personal work, I set them for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, or like I'm doing only this size or I'm doing this number of series or I'm doing this kind of print um, where it's not as much of a free for all as a lot of other artists do in their personal work. Yeah. Um, but having said that, yes, I would like to expand a little more because that's also how you get to do your own personal style and the things you really care about for the client work is you see they see what you're making for yourself and they're like oh man I want that Mm -hmm. so I don't know I've said this for like four years now like this is the year I'm gonna (laughs) really do some personal work but we'll see yeah well it's different too because it's like with client work you kind of know you're getting paid like it's not that your fans aren't gonna buy your personal work but it's just I imagine once you're in that groove of from client project to client project, it's like obviously easier to, not easier, but just like anyone would take that work before potentially yeah. like spending that. It's hard to like say no and spend that time on your own, yes. on your own work. Um, How do you add meaning and inspiration to your art? Ooh, um, I do like every, I feel like I need everything to be meaningful, Um, but that is on, a huge scale. Ooh, that's tough because there's so many ways I could attack this. Um, okay. So yeah, I think if it's public art, um, if it's depending on what kind of organization I'm working with, um, they will bring some meaning themselves. Um, so like just for an example, I did this one, um, last summer and it was an installation in this, it's this new place out in Redmond, it's like three buildings um, above that, like the 
most of the buildings is just affordable housing, but then on the bottom floor are, it's like office spaces for, there's like 25 or 40 companies that work out of the space and it's all kinds of like social cause um, organizations. And so like you can, as a uh, resident or not as a resident, as a um, civilian, just anyone can walk in and just say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. It could be oh my God, anything, mental health. It could be, I can't pay my rent. It can be um, like, there's a language barrier that I can't get through. They need something. Um, literally any problem that they have, they can walk in and be pointed in the direction um, of an organization that can help them. It's amazing. That's amazing. Um, it's really cool. And so I did like a lobby installation for them. Um, and so for that type of art, the meaning is ingrained because the work that they do, all of those organizations do, are meaningful on their own. And so my job was to, like, I did a lot of research. I listened. I listened more than I thought, um, or it wasn't more my ideas. It was like pulling out of listening sessions of like bits of information. And my job was to come in and kind of illustrate a concept that embodied this whole big infrastructure of social organizations um turned out really cool they were happy with it i was happy with it i ended up doing like a pacific northwest nurse log so it's like the logs that fall in the forest and then they're they are the support system for all these little seedlings that grow um it's just one big metaphor but i think that's where the meaning comes from is like I listen for it. I don't necessarily always create it myself because then it feels like it's not, it feels like it's my story when it shouldn't be. Um, yeah. Well, these projects you're working on too are really like these collaborations and yes. you're kind of the channel or the vessel that's helping tell this cause. And so like, that's your, what you're like so good at is like adding beauty and helping visually tell the story yeah. um, that, that like, kind of these organizations don't necessarily have that skill set. So that's where you come in and why you're so busy and crushing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's cool. I like being that, or I like having that role for people because yeah, they struggle, they know what they're doing, um, but they struggle to visualize it a lot of times. And it takes someone who is not involved at all, has no, you know, nothing in that game um, to just like come in and see it and make it. So yeah. So Fun. you're giving, you're giving your, you know, all this time to these organizations and your, your skill set. What brings you joy outside of your work and your creative? I mean, obviously I, as creatives, I know like our art has to bring us joy in, in order for it to work, but what do you like to do? Or what are some of your hobbies that don't have to do with painting? I love taking day trips around Seattle. Um, there's just so much to see. You can drive a couple hours in any direction and be in like a completely different environment. So sometimes I do need just a hard break where I'm like, let's go out to Whidbey Island or let's go up to down to Rainier, like anything like that, usually nature based. Um, and then sometimes, sometimes I just need to like sit on the couch and watch garbage TV. Oh, I feel um, that. I just got to zone out for a little bit. Um, I struggled with burnout a lot, a couple, like starting two years ago into last year, you know, I can't always like take a trip or do like a real break where that was like a little mini break. It was just like a turn off my brain kind of day. Um, and that helped, that helped get through the like, just constant being bogged down with everything. And then I like to garden. <laughs> as yeah. silly as that is um I love it just like being outside um getting my hands dirty again like it's a zoning out thing where I'm not thinking of work um anything that can kind of get me in that headspace is kind of what I gravitate towards so you said you were struggling with burnout um do you feel like you've gotten maintained now a bit more of a balance for yourself or what does that balance look like well 
Um, I am still struggling with it just because I did all the tricks, man. I raised my prices. I like I did all the tricks and nothing really worked as significantly as I was expecting. Definitely my trajectory is coming out of burnout. I don't feel how I did a couple of years ago. And I'm also valuing, like, I think kind of how we talked about when you first start out on your own, that hustle has to be there. That's how you get your traction. That's how you become successful. But then kind of once you've gained that momentum, it doesn't necessarily have to keep up at that speed. And I struggled with that a lot because I felt like if I wasn't working or wasn't doing something, it was wrong and I was wasting my time. And so like forcing myself to have a mindset shift helped a lot, still struggling with that, but getting there. And then I started saying no to projects. You know, it, it was years and I would say yes to everything because I needed to pay all my bills. But when something wasn't a good fit or they didn't have the budget I needed to get it done, I started to say no and that or point them in the direction of another artist, like something that I'm not just like closing a door. I'm kind of just like diverting. That really helped a lot, too, even mm -hmm. though it felt, it felt weird in the beginning. Um, yeah, saying no is huge. And I think. I've heard that from a lot of other artists I've talked to is that in the beginning, you're just like hustling. You feel like if you don't work for you know, one hour of one day, then like it's all going to go away. And it is really important to build that foundation. Like you just have to work harder than like maybe the average person working a job because you're literally starting to build this business from nothing. But longevity wise and in order to last, there does need to be this transition to where you can like enjoy that work-life balance. And that's something I've struggled with too. And I've had to find myself and just take time off. And, and I think it's something we can all relate to. And I was going to ask, but you already, you already said like saying no is so huge. And, and um, I think it's like almost stepping out of like that scarcity mindset and into like another project's going to come, even if I say no to this one and like only saying yes to the things that feel really aligned. Yeah. Isn't and it took a while because if I said no to something or if I, to really believe that, oh, another project's coming along, um, that took a while because I was like, maybe I'm just having like a good year. Maybe it's just a like a fluke. Um, but then when that consistently happens year after year after year, and you see that you're taking on larger work um, with bigger budgets and being able to take on more meaningful work, um, and really like put your heart into the big stuff instead of some of the smaller jobs um, that I would take on in 2015. When you see that trajectory kind of just like consistently go up, um, I mean, it took years for me to trust it. And now yeah. I could probably say this year, possibly maybe last year were the first years that I actually did trust it. Like my, um, my husband left his job last year and he works for me now, which is crazy. Oh my God, heck yeah. <laughs> we love that. <laughs> it's a big, um, I don't want to say a gamble because um, he's great. He's also a designer, but um, you know, we have one income now. And yeah. So the pressure still one there. Business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I feel, I still feel okay about it. I, I trust it. So what is he doing for you? <laughs> It's kind of sad because he's like the best designer I know, but he got severely burnt out um, to the point where like, I don't know if I should even be saying this on a podcast, but um, stress, work stress gave him type one diabetes in oh, his thirties. So like, that's it, hard. it just was like, he was in a bad place. And so it's sad because he's so freaking talented and all he's doing for me is like painting backgrounds and like carrying my supplies. You got to have an assistant though. I mean, like you're doing big walls and you're, you're the totally. scale of what you're doing is huge. And like, if you're just showing up alone, I like that wouldn't be possible. You have it's to have someone. Yeah. yeah, totally. And I totally value him. And he's really good at like, kind of all I wanted for years while I was on my own is to have someone as a sounding board, someone to talk through ideas with. Um, and that's kind of where he shines, where if it comes down to execution, I mean, he's fine. He's, he's a good painter. Um, but like you said, he's just kind of an assistant in that aspect where 
if I'm struggling with a concept or figuring out, uh, like I'm doing a project right now that's really strange with the city and it's like um, electrical vehicle chargers and there's just like so many rules involved and parameters wow. that I'm like, I don't, I don't even know what to do, even though they're letting me do whatever I want. Um, just having another person there daily to talk through ideas, um, like look through research, just having kind of like a studio mate helps tremendously. So that's actually where I value him the most. To come up with all of that on your own, like once a business, like, you know, once your art business gets to a certain point, it's impossible to do alone. And so, yeah, um, it does so much help. Like I value my partner, Corey, a lot too. And like, I'm constantly bouncing ideas off him and he's running his own business, but like, I need that in order to like sanely make decisions sometimes, like just the decision-making part of like, what do I tell this client or, you know, like that stuff's really hard and it it's takes a certain worst. skill set. Yeah. He's been great. It's been a year and a half now. Um, and yeah, everyone's like, oh, this is going to make or break your relationship, but it's been, it's been good so far. So He'll be my permanent assistant moving That's forward. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, you you're building a life together, and it's so much better then because you both are like equally invested. And sometimes when you hire people that aren't, you know, yeah. necessarily affiliated, like no one's gonna work as hard as you are. But it seems like when it's a couple and it's teamwork, like you're both fully invested. So that's really awesome. What can we expect to see from you in the future? What are you excited about that's coming up in this next year? I think overall, the two things that are on my mind are playing around with some style a little more. Um, I struggled in the past with like not being loose enough. Um, and I don't think my like clean lines, like that type of style will ever change, but just like the subject matter of loosening up a little bit, me being a little more gestural, I'm making like an effort to do that a little more. Um, it's one of those things where like, I'm not confident in it yet where I design it and then I like it in the moment, but then I look at it the next day and I'm like, oh, this looks wrong or this looks bad. So trying to trust myself a little more, loosen up. Um, and then also making a conscious effort to work and partner more with the socially driven organizations. I really love that work. Um, it's been probably three or four years of continuous partnerships. Um, with some of them and it's just always the most rewarding so I think kind of developing that client base a little more though that's um that's what I'm focusing on a lot I partnered with Seattle Kraken and it's a program they have that they put artists like we get to design a warm-up jersey and then they auction off the jersey for charity and I'm last in the series for this season so my night isn't until April but um I really like that partnership and that's exciting. That's big. That's the hockey team for Seattle for people yes. that don't know. I get to ride. I'm going to be like seven and a half months pregnant riding as Zamboni in April. Wow. So you're expecting that's exciting. Expecting. You have a um, lot coming up. Yeah. Oh my gosh. A big year. Big but year. Yeah, the Zamboni ride I keep thinking about because I'm like, I'm going to be massive and I'm going to be on the jumbo screen and it's going to be hilarious, but also embarrassing. It's going to be amazing. You're going to look great. So does the night of like your night with the Kraken, your jerseys featured that you've created, you've designed, and then you're riding a, the Zamboni, what else goes into that night? Yeah. So we made, um, there's a Jersey and then they, all of the, I don't know if you've been to the arena, but, um, all of the graphics and the screens they use my designs for. Um, so I made them some assets to be able to like plug in there. It's almost like a night of rebranding where it's just my design, my work to, and they're selling, um, That's huge. It's very cool. I was yeah. super excited cause I really like hockey. Um, but yeah, like they'll sell merch night of where everyone can get something. The actual jerseys, what is auctioned off, but the whole arena kind of turns into, my designs for a night and it's just going to be so cool. Oh my gosh. Your designs like huge scale, larger than life. That's going to be amazing. I'm so I excited think they for even you. Project it down onto the ice. Which oh is, my God. Like, it's, it's a big deal. I'm very excited to see it. 
It's been so interesting just hearing your story and hearing about like how you've gone from upstate New York to where you are now. You're going to be projected in the Kraken arena. What's the arena (laughs) called? I don't even know. Uh, Climate Pledge Arena. The Climate Pledge Arena. Okay. So yeah, you're crushing it. Um, I wish you the best with all of your future endeavors with this year with the new baby. That's so exciting. Uh, Yes. Terrifying. Exciting. But yeah. Yeah. It is a new, it's a whole new chapter for sure. Yeah. I yeah. think it'll be interesting being an artist mom. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that's going to work. They're out there though. And they're, yeah, they they're crushing it. So yeah. you can do it. Totally. I have faith. Yes. It'll be great. All right, Sarah. Well, keep in touch. Um, and thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. This was fun.